Good afternoon, Year 8, and welcome to another video lesson uh, with me, Mr. Davis. In today's lesson, we are looking again at Victorian poetry, and we're looking at a lovely kind of ballad, uh, a kind of a lyrical ballad by the American poet Emily Dickinson, one of the most, one of the better known and most famous and well respected American poets of the 19th century. Uh, and we're looking at a poem called Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Okay. Um, my edition is not the same as your edition for some reason. I, for some reason, the edition I have, which is a, from the modern American verse, uh, my copy has a missing stanza. So when we get to stanza five, uh, I've had to write out, you'll see it better when, with the other camera, but I've had to write out stanza five uh, that's for some reason not included in my version. So what we'll do is we'll go through, I'll give you a, not too much today because we've already covered the Victorian period multiple times, but I'll give you a bit of background about today's poet and about the form of the poem before we look at our reading of today's poem, uh, because I could not stop for death. Okay, uh, so I'll see you soon. Okay, so here we have a portrait of Emily Dickinson, today's poet. Um, Emily Dickinson was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, which is a state in America, it's where Boston is, um, in 1830. Uh, she's born into quite a religious, well, a very religious family in New England, um, and she dies in 1886. One of the most interesting facts about her life is that she chose to self-isolate, ironically, I know in, in these times, but she chose to live in more or less seclusion uh, for the last quarter of a century of her life. Uh, so she she spent her time she spent time only with herself uh, and her and her relatives her family. Um, so she's quite a mysterious figure uh, who wrote powerful poetry about mortality, about th Christian themes, and about death um, in her seclusion. So, like I said, she's she she counts as a Victorian poet, although quite a lot of her work actually remained unpublished until 30 years after her death. So, so her work was largely pu published posthumously, which means after her death, which is kind of another interesting fact about her. Uh, and her work is known for its interesting use of imagery, its interesting use of metaphor, uh, and its powerful, as I said, spiritual themes. Um, and she was included in the literary history of the United States in 1948. That's one of the most important anthologies, which kind of, uh, if you're included in that, you're, you're part of the canon, part of the body of work of American literature. So her work has become uh, increasingly well known. Another famous work besides the poem we're looking at today uh, would be Hope is the Thing with Feathers, which is a beautiful poem, a beautiful extended metaphor. Um, and you've, you've also got poems uh, published in uh, her unpublished poems, which is in 1936. So this poem that we're looking at today is, is an example of one of her poems that dwells on the theme of, of mortality or on death. Um, it's a really interesting poem for, for numerous reasons, uh, and I'm excited about teaching it to you. The poem today that we're looking at is called Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Uh, and we'll have a look at the poem and have a read through before we discuss its deeper significance uh, later in today's lesson. So on your screen, you have a copy of the poem, which is which I've taken from the Poetry Foundation website. I do have a copy myself, but as I've said, my 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 edition uh, is missing stanza five. So I'm going to read this through a couple of times, and then and then before we actually look at the deeper meaning of the poem, I'm going to explain some of the tricky vocabulary that uh, is in this poem, and define some of the terms for you. So this is because I could not stop for death by Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, an immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labour and my leisure too, for his civility. We passed the school where children strove, at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain, we passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us, the dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippets only tall. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling in the ground, the roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet, feel shorter than the day. I first surmised the horse's heads were towards eternity. Okay, so that's today's poem. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and explain to you some of the, some of the trickier vocabulary uh, in each stanza. And I suggest you just jot these words down, or if you've, ideally, if you've got your own copy of the poem, just annotate the definition besides... The word. Okay, so the first word I'm actually, I, I, I think I should define for you, and you've, and you've got an image of it on the board now. Uh, it's actually from stanza four, and it's the word gossamer. 
Uh, gossamer is a material it's very kind of um, very fragile and very light uh, as you can see it's kind of almost almost opaque almost almost um, not opaque rather almost transparent you can almost see through it um, so that's what gossamer is gossamer is also the name for the spider silk uh, that spiders use to weave their web so that's the first word you might not know uh, is the word gossamer Okay, the next word some of us might not recognise has just come up on the board, uh, and that is the word tippet. And, and a tippet is demonstrated on the screen here. It's a kind of shawl-like um, item of clothing, a bit like a scarf, but um, an old, kind of an old-fashioned type of shawl to keep someone warm um, as, an, as an overlayer. Okay, so that's the second word. So we've had so far gossamer, and now we have tippet. And the final word we might be unfamiliar with from that stanza is the word tool and again I've got an image of what that is it's another textile another material and again it's another very light almost transparent material uh, that wouldn't particularly keep you very warm just remember that uh, as we when we come to stanza four so the next word is tool so so far we have gossamer tippet and tool all of all of them references to textiles or materials used for clothing okay brilliant let's look at the next uh, piece of challenging vocabulary you might not be familiar with is the word cornice uh, and a cornice is again you've got a picture of it on your screen it's just coming up now and that just means a, a molding around a room or a, or a overhanging uh, molding around a room or a ceiling okay so you've got the image of what that means just there there's the cornice here and I mean it's obviously on the corner of the building it can also refer to snow on a mountain that's overhanging a precipice okay so that's corner and the final word, I'm sure there'll be others, but I'll go over those as we read the poem closely. The final word you might not know has just come up on the screen now, so I'll take you a moment to read that word and its definition, surmise. Fine, that's brilliant. Okay, so we can start looking at the poem in a bit more detail now. Okay, I'm going to ask you now uh, to take a read of the poem yourself with your annotated uh, definitions beside you. And just pause the video, take some time to consider your own impressions of the poem, you know, on, in terms of your first impressions and what you find interesting about it so far. And what I would suggest you do, and I'll get a piece of paper so I can demonstrate, what I would suggest you do is you have something like, you know, first impressions uh, and then what you find interesting and just turn it into a mind map and brainstorm your ideas so pause the video for me read the poem yourself a couple of times through and just get your first impressions together gather your thoughts and i'll see you again in about five minutes okay welcome back so i thought i would read the poem out to you uh, one more time and then we'll look at this almost line by line stanza by stanza okay so uh, because I Could Not Stop for Death by Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and how I had put away my labour and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain, we passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet's only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet, feel shorter than the day. I, felt semi I first surmised the horse's head were toward eternity. Brilliant poem. We'll, we'll look at it in more detail now. Okay, I thought we should consider the title uh, first. The, uh, because I think it always gives you an insight into the themes of the poem and its deeper meaning. And the title is Because I Could Not Stop for Death. And what I think is interesting is this idea that the poetic voice, the I, the speaker of the poem, uh, introduces this, the major theme straight away, which is death. And in the poem, I'll put the theme at the top, in the poem, the speaker, I think you would have all noticed this, the speaker of the poem personifies death. Uh, as, as the driver of a chariot or as a, 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 the driver of a, a carriage uh, who is taking her, the speaker, to uh, hell or to, not to hell, sorry, to, to the afterlife. Um, so she, 
the speaker is t being taken, being driven to the afterlife by death himself uh, and chaperoned perhaps by immortality. Okay, um, and it's an interesting way of phrasing it because I could not stop for death. Um, it's almost as if the speaker is announcing that death has politely given her a lift, taken her to the to the afterlife, uh, almost as if death is doing her a favour. Um, is one possible way of looking at it. It's, a, it's, an, it's an odd way of phrasing it. You could also argue that she's been taken by death because she could not stop herself. She wasn't willing to, perhaps, and death is taking her uh, to the afterlife uh, when may, perhaps she didn't want to go in the first place. So it's, it's, a, it's quite essentially what I'm trying to say in fewer words is that it's quite an ambiguous title, okay? And the title is repeated in the opening line of the poem. Um, and you notice the poem has got this kind of fairly straightforward structure. It's Each stanza is just four lines long. It's just a quatrain. Uh, and you have a kind of A, B, C, B rhyme scheme. And it feels like a nursery rhyme. There is a certain nursery rhyme quality to it. Okay, so I'll put nursery rhyme. And usually nursery rhymes are fairly straightforward. They're obviously for children. They're not designed to be complex. However, I think what Dickinson does in this poem is, is compose a particularly complicated poem. I think there's lots of layers to this poem. Okay, So the poem begins, Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. And we have two obvious examples of, of how she personifies death. And death becomes uh, this literally a human figure. And I'll put an image on the board to to kind of give give to give you an example of what she might be referring to here. So on your screen you have an image of the kind of literary trope, which is the personification of death, which we would recognise as the Grim Reaper. Okay, and Dickinson personifies death as the driver of this carriage that has kindly stopped for him, stopped for the speaker. I think it's an interesting use of um, adverb. To, kindly so i would argue that you could make the interpretation that death is presented as a gentleman as someone who is chivalrous who is uh, courteous and has offered the, a lift to the speaker um you could alternatively interpret it as being tongue-in-cheek and perhaps she's being sarcastic uh, and actually she's bitter about the fact that death has uh, picked her up in its in its carriage and is wheeling her off into the afterlife but either way, I think we recognise the figure of death uh, from this, from almost from the cartoonish caricature that is the Grim Reaper. I'm going to give you an alternative reading of the poem now, which is, it might feel like a bit of a tangent, but bear with me and, I, and I'll support this reading of the poem as we go through. So I've given you the explanation that it's very likely that, you know, she might be referring to death and, and, and it's an image that Christians would recognise uh, as the Grim Reaper. It's, a, it's kind of a Western modern image of death. Here's the alternative you could argument you can make. Let me just go through it now. Okay, the alternative reading of this poem, which I think I think this poem can be read as an allegory for either the you know either it from a Christian perspective, but I think there is an argument to be made that this is a this is a reference, this entire poem is a reference and an allegory, uh, which means a story a kind of a story or a poem with hidden meaning. An allegory for a Greek myth, a myth from a myth from classical mythology. Uh, and here on your screen you have an image of Hades, who I'm sure most of you would know uh, in Greek myth. He's the brother of Zeus and Poseidon. Zeus is the god of the sky and the, and the kind of the chief god on Mount Olympus. And Poseidon is the god of the oceans, the god of the sea. He's often pictured as a kind of half man, half mermaid figure who holds a trident. Uh, their brother Hades is given the kingdom of Tartarus, which is the underworld. Um, in Roman mythology, Hades, Hades is actually referred to as Pluto, hence the name of the planet. So we have here a picture of Hades, uh, and Hades is the personification often of death in Greek myth. Okay, so we've looked at an example of Christian myth or kind of Western modern myth where we look at the death being represented as the Grim Reaper. Alternatively, you could look at this as being uh, an example of a personification and a reference to Hades from Greek myth. Okay, so in Greek myth, uh, you've got another image on your board here. In Greek myth, Hades has a wife. He has a wife in the underworld who uh, spends, and we'll look at that why, why, this, why this happens. She spends the winters uh, 
in the underworld with him and the summers uh, on earth. His wife is known as what well, is called Persephone. And here's an image of Persephone. And it's worth knowing about the myth of Persephone uh, before we read this poem, because I think it gives us a very interesting allegorical or, or subtextual meaning to this poem, which means a second meaning. In the picture, you can see that the young, that at first you can see that Persephone is a young girl. And it's interesting that his wife is a, such a young girl. Uh, you can also see that she's holding memento mori. Those, that means kind of symbols of death in her uh, left arm. She's cradling skulls, which kind of symbolizes the fact that she is, uh, she is uh, related to the underworld, related to death. In her right hand, she has the seeds of a pomegranate, which is a fruit uh, that has kind of uh, quite flavoursome seeds that people would eat, will eat. They'll pick, pick them and eat them. And pomegranates are seeds uh, that represent fertility in lots of myths. So it's interesting that she's holding these um, objects and she's and she's kind of covered in kind of a climbing plants because she's rep she's closely linked to nature as well. So this is Persephone and this is this is Hades wife. Uh, and I think it's interesting to know the myth about how she came to be Hades' wife before we look at this poem. OK, I'm going to use an art artist's interpretation of the myth to, to kind of support me in my explanation of this wonderful story. It's a, it's a wonderful story. It's also a kind of a sinister, creepy uh, myth as well. So in the, in the myth, uh, Persephone, who we've just talked about, she is a young girl. She's the daughter of the goddess Demeter, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture of Demeter later on, but Demeter is worth remembering. She is the god of uh, the harvest. Demeter is associated with grain and with, um, with uh, the fertility of life on earth. So when we talk about Demeter, she's kind of responsible for a good harvest. She's responsible for the healthy grow growth of crops. She's a very, very important god uh, in Greek religion, okay? So Persephone is the god is the daughter of um, Demeter, and in the myth, Persephone is wandering around picking berries, picking fruits, and suddenly the the earth kind of opens up, and Hades springs from the earth from a kind of chasm in the earth, uh, riding his chariot. As you can see in the image, there's a chariot, and that's led by horses, and he abducts and kidnaps the young girl, and she disappears and he takes her down to Tartarus, down to the underworld, and makes her his bride. Um, in the myth, he also feeds her uh, the po some, some pomegranate seeds. And in the Greek myths, this means that her soul kind of has to stay in Tartarus, that it can't leave. In the myth later on, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Demeter, her mother, um, realises that her child has been abducted. And in her state of grief, she abandons her role as the protector or, or the nurturer of the earth and the protector of the harvests. So the plants fail, uh, the crops fail, there, there is no harvest. There's, it's kind of a perpetual winter as she grieves for her daughter and she goes on a voyage to try and um, rescue her. And eventually she agrees with Hades to uh, allow Persephone um, to spend the summers with her and the winters she spends with him. So that's the kind of myth that's being, I think, referred to as an illusion in this poem, the myth of the abduction of Persephone. And I would argue that you could, you, or I would suggest that you could argue rather that you could read this poem as being an allegory and that the speaker is speaking in the vo voice of the young Persephone who was abducted by Hades. So that's the reading I think you ought to know about before we actually look at the poem itself. Okay, so we were at the line uh, he kindly stopped for me. And I think, you, like I said, you could read this either way. It could be tongue in cheek. It could be literally that gen that death is a gentleman caller and she's being chaperoned by immortality. So Im immortality is also personified. And we know that immortality obviously means the idea of living forever, which is something, just go back to that Greek reading, the gods and Olympus were all immortal. So maybe it goes back to this idea. Um the third line, the carriage hell, but just ourselves and immortality. So it is a reference to either she's being, she's, she's isolated, she's solitary, she's only accompanied by death himself and death has taken her or is taking her on the journey. And the rest of the poem really, I just draw an arrow to represent it. The rest of the poem is really describing the journey of the speaker and the personification of death voyaging from earth to uh, the afterlife to the underworld, depending on your reading of the poem.
And it's interesting that I would argue that, like I said earlier, I think um, immortality is kind of chaperoning them in a sense. So there is a kind of, there is, you could argue a kind of romantic element to this in that she's being uh, escorted by a gentleman caller to the afterlife. And um, I suppose graves are often referred to as, as beds of the, you know, in, you know I, I, they're referred to in that kind of way in, in literature. So perhaps the marriage bed that she's being brought to is actually her deathbed, okay? Stanza two continues the description of the initial journey. Uh, it begins, we slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labour and my leisure too for his civility. Um, so what she means by that is, she, what's interesting about this stanza is that the description of how they're not, they're not rushing. They're not rushing to the afterlife. They're going quite slowly. He's not in a uh, he being death is not in a rush to take her into the afterlife. And perhaps he wants to show her uh, glimpses of her own life. So I, I know I've given you quite a few different various readings for this poem, but you could read this now as being a metaphor. And death is going to show her her life up until this point. And I guess it goes back to that old cliche that when someone thinks they're dying, there's a tendency for them to think that their life flashes before their eyes. Maybe you could read the following stanzas as her life flashing before her eyes, uh, before she dies. So he's slowly driving. He knows no haste. I put away my labour and my leisure. Uh, what she means by that is she's put away any, you know, any work that she had, any leisure that she has as well. And she's just preparing herself fully, I think, for death. I think she's, I think this is about immersing herself in death. I think it's kind of metaphorical. And she does it out of politeness for him because she's accompanying him and because he's been so civil in giving her the lifts. So rather than working on anything, rather than, you know, rather than um, being distracted, she's uh, committing herself to concentrating on the journey. So I don't think there's anything particularly interesting in stanza two besides this idea of him slowly driving, which kind of goes against the reading of it being an allegory for the story of Hades and the abduction of Persephone. Uh, because Hades, you know, he leaps out of the earth and then straight back down into the earth with his chariot. Stanza three, um, we'll look at afterwards. So can I get you so far just to have a little pause up until civility and just summarise your understanding of the poem so far. Uh, so please pause the video, take five to ten minutes to do that. Um, present your ideas in bullet points or in full sentences, please. And I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, stanza three is loaded, I think, with interesting imagery. I think this is where the metaphor really takes off. So the key techniques we're looking out for are metaphor and imagery. And most of these imagery, most of these images rather, are sensory. So let's do with the vision. Uh, and the, I think they're deeply symbolic. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a bit longer on stanza three than we did on the previous stanzas. Let's just read it through. We passed the school where children played at wrestling in a ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. There are so many different interpretations for this. Um, I tend to, I think my initial reading of this is that it's, it's an allegory for life itself and the various stages of life. So you have the stage of infancy, the, the image of the school. You have the stage of labour or work or adult life where you're providing for your family by, you know, rape, by pr producing grain. And you've got that final stage, which is death. So you might have... You're, 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 you might read it as infancy, uh, adulthood, and death. And that supports our reading earlier, that this is a poem that explores uh, the idea of, of the life flashing before your eyes. It could be childhood, adulthood, death, possibly. I think it's interesting that she now speaks in the collective pronoun of we. So she's talking about her and death. They passed the school where children played at Resting in the Ring. It might just be an example of juxtaposition as well, this, these two lines, because she's at the end of her life being whisked away to the afterlife. And I suppose the school represents the beginnings of someone else's life. School is where you learn the foundations or the skills that will set you up for later life. So maybe it's a dramatic contrast between uh, the stage that she's entering, death, and the stage that the children are entering. Um, and the fact that they're wrestling in the ring, this idea of them having leisure time, having playtime and having and having a sense of community I think this is about the again it's, it might be an example of juxtaposition because this is an image of socialization of socializing uh, and she is of course more ostracized more more isolated with only death to accompany her
but I think it's a, it's a kind of wonderful image of innocence, a wonderful image of um, of memory, this of this vague memory she has of being a child, of being at school, of of playing in a ring with her child, with her fellow with her fellow classmates. I think I think there's a strong reading of that that could be that's about the stages of life. In stanza three, we pass the fields of gazing grain, we pass the setting sun. I think again we've got lots of natural imagery. We've got the image now of the gazing grain, and it's a brilliant metaphor. This idea of the grain being personified and watching them as they pass, perhaps. Uh, or it's gazing up at the sun. Perhaps it's a description of the way that I'll show you a picture. Actually, perhaps it's, it's this image that she's created. Just it's just trying to conjure or cap capture rather the idea of how the grain is kind of erect and how how the kind of the heads of the grain at the top are looking upwards at the sun that provides it with nurture uh, and with life. It's a brilliant image of the gazing grain. It could, like I said, it could represent her adult life and the idea that we, you know, in a kind of metaphorical sense, we spend our adults' lives labouring, in a sense, labouring in the fields or working to provide for our families. Uh, that, that's a potential second reading as well. Uh, let's go back to the alternative reading. And we talked about the allegorical story. We talked about the story of, of the abduction of Persephone. Here is an image of Persephone's mother, Demeter, and you can see that she has stood in a field of grain. And remember, she was worshipped for being the goddess of fertility, particularly of the grain and of cereals. And she's associated with a good harvest. And again, she's an incredibly important god. Remember that the Greeks were an agrarian society, so they, many of them lived off of the land. So when, when she's describing this, this gazing grain, perhaps this is a metaphor for the mother. Perhaps the gazing grain metaphorically represents Demeter gazing and searching for her for her abducted child perhaps it's just a reading of of the poem but i think it's it's almost too coincidental for her to describe this image of of grain and 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 i think to, if you're a classicist if you know the myths you always associate grain with demeter and of course demeter has lost her child and the stanza ends with this i think deeply symbolic natural image uh we pass the setting sun and I think we can make various interpretations I'm sure you'll make more interesting interpretations than the ones that I'll offer you uh, I think we could say it kind of maybe fairly obviously represents death itself the sun, the sun obviously symbolic of life on earth uh, the fact that it's setting bringing in darkness and darkness and its associations with death um, it might represent the idea of her of that stage of her life coming to an end the idea of, of she's labored and now she that stage is, of the of life is over the setting sun also brings uh, you know a change in temperature uh, a sudden coldness and there's actually a, a change a shift in the description of the temperature in the poem itself uh, and you know this iciness this coldness that's described in the poem is obviously strongly associated with the grave and death as well so I think this setting sun symbol actually represents a tonal shift in the poem going from being kind of almost celebratory of the beauty of life and we've just seen those images of life childhood uh, the gazing grain and now we have it turning darker and more brooding as it becomes more focused on the uh, afterlife a final interpretation i think you can go, go for is um the reading of the setting sun representing the afterlife in the in the greek sense so again the setting sun representing the underworld and this idea that hades is bringing persephone the speaker of the poem arguably back down with to the underworld with him okay we're going to take another checkpoint here i know we only covered one stanza but because it's so dense and so rich with imagery and metaphor i think it's worth pausing here again so can i get you to pause the video for 10 minutes uh, and summarise your understanding of that previous stanza, stanza three, and I'll see you again shortly. Okay, welcome back. I've included the next stanza on the screen rather than in my copy, because like I said, uh, my edition, for some reason uh, unknown to me, has decided to cut that, that stanza out. I think it's a really interesting stanza. Um, so I'll read the stanza out, and then we'll have a look at the closer and deeper meaning of the stanza. So we've just had this image of we passed the setting sun and we had a dash. And I'm just going to have a tangent here. I think the dashes are used throughout the poem, uh, those, those single line dashes, to represent the act of mimesis or mimicry. Uh, mimesis just means mim uh, mimicry in, in Greek. 
And what I mean by that is that um, Dickinson is trying to imitate or mimic the movement or the journey of the carriage towards the afterlife. So the gown, so the so the dash just represents another step on the journey, in my opinion. You can read it differently if you want. Um, or rather, it says, "He passed us." The Jews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet's only tool. Um, and what students find particularly confusing about this is the he passed us aspect. And it's and the speaker interrupts herself quite a few times. And you could you could read it. I've just given you one interpretation. It's about the journey. You could read it also about you know uh, a heightened sense of fear at this point, uh, and hence the interruptions, the lack of uh, eloquence. She's lost for words because she's fearful. So people find that line, he passed us, quite confusing. Who is the he that's being personified? Remember, you're going to, to, you're going to have to take notes as I speak at this point because I don't have the copy. Uh, you're supposed to be taking notes anyway, but just it's, I know it's a bit unusual. I'm not writing at the same time. He passed us is personified. Who is the he? Is it a reference to uh, death again? It backs to this idea of Hades, but surely it goes back. No, surely it goes back to the setting sun and the setting sun passing them instead of the, instead of them passing it. So perhaps it's another example of a personification. In, in this sense, it's the shadows or the darkness that are personified. So now we've got three things so far in the poem, just to recap, that have been personified. We have the driver, death. We have the chaperone, immortality. We now have the personification. Oh, we've had the grain as well, I suppose. But we've also had now um, this idea of the shadows or the darkness that emanates from the setting sun being personified. If we're going to read this from the Greek angle, which we have been reading it as a kind of allegory of that myth of Persephone, perhaps is a reference to the Greek god Erebus, who's the god of darkness. Um, he's one of the primordial, one of the earliest gods. Erebus is spelled E-R-E-B-U-S. Perhaps it's, it's only one reading. But what we certainly notice in this stanza is a marked shift in the tone of the poem. We've got these glorious and radiant and bright images in stanza three. And now we have very much a shift. The sun has set and now we have dew, which is what is the moisture that gathers in the mornings after 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 dark. So it's a kind of a moisture that's associated with, with the cold, with the darkness. The Jews have, have gathered and they're quivering and cold, okay? So there's been a sudden plunging in temperature. The dew drops are gathering, they've they're going into the, they're 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 journeying into the darkness, they're journeying towards death itself, and there's a there's a huge drop in temperature. The the drop drops are quivering and chilly. And then we have a description of what the poet or the speaker rather is wearing. For only gossamer my gown. It's a strange use of syntax, but what she means is that her gown is made only out of gossamer. So her gown, I'll just show you a picture of that again. Uh, in fact, if you go back to the video, you'll, you'll remember the gossamer is that, that light material. So the gown that she's wearing is made of gossamer. Okay, that's the first thing she means. I think that's interesting that the gown that the speaker is wearing is made of gossamer because I personally read that as meaning that she is not prepared to die. I think it, it, it suggests that she, it supports the reading of this ad, ad, this reading of the abduction myth because she's not prepared to die. She's not come prepared to be to be voyaging into death. She's not dressed well enough for the temperature. That's my reading of it. You could also read it as being a reference to um, the kind of light clothes that the dead wear when they're presented to their relatives in the coffin. So perhaps it's a reference to her death, you know, the clothes she wears in death. Um, she continues, my tippet only tool. And a tippet we've just looked at, that's that kind of scarf-like uh, piece of clothing. And that's made only of a similar material to the gown, which is tool, another light material. And I think, again, I think this supports both readings. It could be allegorically representing the process of dressing the dead and what the dead wear uh, as, they're, as, they're, as they're lowered into the ground. I think it could also represent the gown and the, and the, and the clothing of Persephone, uh, which we've talked about earlier as well. Uh, it's a really open-ended poem in that sense. I think you can read it in either way. But essentially, there are references throughout this line, uh, this stanza and these lines, to a change in temperature, a change in atmosphere in the poem, change in the mood, and also a, a, a change in terms of the speaker's voice. It's much more fractured and fragmented, and I think fearful, uh, because she's reaching her destination, which is, of course, uh, the afterlife and the grave.
and we'll use this as an opportunity now to take another checkpoint and just give I'm going to give you a bit less time than last time here just five minutes to just clarify uh, your understanding have a think have a read through that stanza again and write a short summary of that stanza please so please pause the video and I'll see you in five minutes okay welcome back so we're now at stanza five um, and I'll read it to you and then we'll go through and look at this in a bit more detail we paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice but a mound. Okay, I think this is an interesting image. I think this is a fascinating image. Um, I would argue that this represents, this stanza represents the um, final destination of the journey that this uh, that the speaker is going on. I think it, it, it links to an to the to an image of the grave. I would say there's where she's reached. I think that's the house. Um, I think it represents the end of the voyage that they've undertaken. So they pause. They stop before a house that seemed. I think the house. I just think of, I associate that with the house of the dead, right? So they pause at the final destination. It's the house of the dead, and it appears to the speaker to be a swelling of the ground. And I think we can just see. Visually, that's such a such a vibrant and vivid image in our imaginations. The swelling here of of the ground, and immediately it brings to mind uh, a burial mound, a tomb, a grave. The swelling of the ground. Uh, the roof is scarcely visible, and the cornice, which we talked about earlier, is but a mound. So you've got this kind of clear reference to the grave that they've arrived at, and presumably uh, her final resting place. So if we're going to read it in the way that we talked about at the beginning of the poem, that this is a poem about death. It's about the journey to the afterlife of the speaker. She's ruminating about her own mortality and she's arrived at the final resting place for the, for the dead, the grave. Okay, that's the final image that we're left with. Perhaps that's one way of looking at it. We could also read it as being uh, metaphorical or an allusion to the afterlife in the Greek afterlife, the underworld or Tartarus, and they're arriving at the house of the dead, which is what was, which is how uh, you know the underworld was known. And of course, the ruler of the house of the dead is Hades. So there's different ways of looking at this, uh, but it's certainly it's, whichever way you look at it, it's certainly almost undeniable that they've arrived at the afterlife. Okay, so, so slightly easier stands in a sense because there's not mu not as much to it. It's the f there's a sense of finality that they've arrived. Um, you could, I'm, sh I'm sure you can read it in different in, in, a, in a different way as well, but I think those are the, like, our most important readings, I would argue. Then we come to this final stanza, and we have a t what's called a temporal shift. I'll write that for you. Um, that's when the writer changes your attention, but not from an object to another object. This temporal just means in terms of time. Temporal just means it's a Latin word for time. So it's the way it's when a writer either uses a flash forward, so it goes forward in time, or a flash back, goes back in time. And here we have a flash forward. Okay. So she says, since then, since what's happened previously in the poem, it's been centuries. So we've had this idea of hundreds of years have passed since she arrived at the grave. Okay, so she's been dead, the speaker, now for centuries. Since then it's been centuries, but each feels shorter than the day. And this is about you know, it's almost a question, almost a kind of um, a phrase that would interest scientists or physicists, those of those of us interested in um, how time, as a uh, time works as a dimension in space, because she's experiencing time in a dif in a different way to how mortals experience time. That's what I would say she's talking about. I'm talking about time here, and I think this again lends itself to our reading of this poem being an allegory for the abduction of Persephone, because again, in becoming the wife of Hades, uh, Persephone does achieve immortality. Remember, Demeter is an immortal god. Uh, the gods of the Olympus in Greek mythology are immortal. And, you know, some of the heroes from Greek myth become immortal. You know, Hercules, as an example, is rewarded after his 12 labours with immortality. Um, so immortality is, Im immortality is linked with you know, with deities, with gods, and I would argue that this really does lend itself to this argument that the speaker is in fact Persephone and she's uh, experiencing time differently because she's achieved immortality and her days, uh, her centuries pass like days. Um, 
and it lends itself to the idea of you know the gods achieve immortality but they feast on ambrosia and nectar which is the food of the gods food of the immortals so i'll write immortality down and you, you can read it differently like i said it could also be interpreted sorry it's the wrong stanza it could also be interpreted as simply the idea that the dead in heaven or the dead wherever they go in a christian context experience time differently so again it's open-ended i think it's deliberately open-ended anyway she said since then it's been centuries each feels shorter than a day i first surmised the horses heads were towards eternity so she's saying it's been centuries since i first guessed that the horses heads were journeying towards the afterlife towards the immortality and the horses heads refer back to the image of death right in stanza one going back here goes right back to stanza one and that image of the carriage picking her up and again just to emphasize the point it could be a reference to you know the carriage of death in a kind of christian context of, the, of death being the grim reaper driving this carriage it could also represent hades and his carriage uh so do you read this or well, I, I, th I suppose I think it's undeniably an allegory. It's undeniably a poem, uh, and I'll define that for you. It's undeniably a poem with a hidden meaning and a subtext that you need to investigate for yourselves. But how do you read this allegory is, is kind of the final question I would like you to consider. Are you more persuaded by the Greek myth uh, reading or are you more persuaded by the idea that it's about, uh, you know, the speaker herself, maybe Dickinson herself, uh, contemplating the afterlife and being... Uh, taken there by the Grim Reaper. And either way, it's a fantastic, fantastic poem. I think largely for the imagery, I think the imagery is wonderful. So before, we're going to do two checkpoints. You're going to do a checkpoint on stanzas five and six, and that's going to take you 10 minutes. And you're going to summarise your understanding of, of stanzas five and six. And then uh, you're going to come back to, to the video. So please pause the video for 10 minutes and summarise stanzas five and six. Okay, welcome back. Your final checklist. I, mean, I would, I would just pause the screen on this so you can, or, or so you can copy this down in your exercise books. But your final checklist is a, is an overview of the whole poem. So I'd like to read over your poem, read over the notes, and then you're going to create these different mind maps. So I want you to focus for about three or four minutes on each one. Firstly, start with the key themes and the big ideas. Then move on to the key images and symbols. Then you've got uh, mood and atmosphere. Then you've got form and structure, and then you've got language and poetic devices. So take your time to uh, digest this poem, to, to come up with your own interpretation, and to have a little think about the overall meaning. So that will take you in total about, well, three minutes per, about 15 minutes to do that. Once you've done that, you, of course, need to pass the quiz on Show My Homework, and you need to complete the independent task that I've set you. Thank you for watching. I hope that was helpful. I hope you enjoyed the poem as much as I do. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye.